this is Alex, and um, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, hang on, you said this was going to be a Cinderella review. Um, well, <laughs> um, some of my friends thought it would be funny if I compared the, the animated Disney Cinderella version with the 2015 live-action version starring Lily James. Um, and for those who keep up with my videos, that version of Cinderella is on my list of most hated films, so um, I didn't really want to do that particularly, but what I am going to do is I'm going to do the Disney animated Cinderella versus the Broadway version that came out in uh, 2013. Um, because that version is really good. It's, um, it's a revival of the Rodgers and Hammersteins musical. It was a huge update and man, oh my god, it was such an improvement. Um, but before that, um, I thought it would be funny as, you know, Cinderella is a Disney movie, um, to dress up as Honor again because any chance to dress up as her is just awesome. And I thought, I'm going to show you how I transform into Anna um, with a slight makeup tutorial. Um, if you guys want to skip this, go right ahead and go straight to the review. So that's absolutely fine. But I just wanted to share what I do in to get ready to make myself look like my favorite Dizzy princess. So, um, well, obviously the first thing you got to do is foundation. Um, I already applied it on me um, before I put the wig on and everything. Um, but um, I basically... Um, I don't think it really matters with Anna particularly what, um, what skin tone you use. Um, I'm quite pale, so I use a very, very light one. Um, so this is my foundation. Um, if you were Elsa, on the other hand, um, being pale is kind of important. So, um, actually, you know, this, this skin, that would, that would be good for Elsa as well. I'm not sure which one it is. I don't know. But I, it's only because I've got quite pale skin anyway, so that's fine. Um, now, the one thing that I will put on, and this is such a useful tip, and this is something that I put on almost every day, or when I go out to work, or, you know, college or whatever, is um, uh, for you ladies that suffer with terrible sleep in your eyes and you just look awful, um, just use a little bit of this. It's a sort of tiny brush of foundation, so you just put it under your eyes, like so, just a tiny little brush. And then get your foundation brush and just, just kind of dab it at first and then put it all over your eyes. So that really helps to make you look more awake and stuff. So now I'm going to show you how to do um, Anna's eyes. Okay, so if you guys look at Elsa, Elsa's a little bit more easy to follow because she's the Snow Queen and she uses a lot, there's a lot of purple in her eyes. So basically you want to do a sort of winter cold look. Anna, of course, is the opposite. And if you're going to... I sort of related mine to both Anna from Frozen, but both um, what the character was inspired from, the fairy, the original Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale. Because I always feel like Anna was inspired by um, the Queen of Summer, I think that was. So basically, you want a lot of warm colours for your eyes. So... Um, and this is the makeup, and sometimes I do use this when I feel like I want to look nicer, is the um, Benefit um, Jet Set. Um, I, I quite like Benefit makeup, I, I, I don't know, I, I just really like it, even if the names are a little bit cheesy, so... Um, but that's what it looks inside. It's a very, very nice warm colours. Okay, so the first one we're going to use is the very, very top one. The very, very top one. That one's called um, Champagne, Please. Yes, I told you these names are cheesy. So, <laughs> okay. So, and then what you want to do with this one is just put it all over your eye. Just very lightly over your eyes. Because that's just the base. It, it won't make too much of a difference. It kind of makes it a little bit... It sort of adds a little bit of glitter to your eyes, but that's just... That's just the um, undercolor or whatever you want to do, the base, so. And then the next one you want to use um, is 
called a uh, gold cord, which is oh, which is the second one down. So it's this one. It's a very very gold color, obviously because it's called gold cord. Um, and this one you just want to put you want to put a little bit more emphasis on this one. So I usually start with the the lower. Just above the, the lash line and then sort of work my way on. You guys are probably laughing because, I, again, I am not into makeup that much, so you're probably thinking, my god, how the fuck did she reply on? It looks ridiculous. I've had no complaints, though. No. <laughs> I've had no complaints from the finishing results, so you know I'm happy. And then you want to put a little bit around the corner on the lower lash line not too much though so you can get that nice nice little glimmer in the corner of your eyes just to make you look just to make you look a little bit more magical <laughs> and then the last color that I use is called Pretty in Mink um, which is the third one down so it's a little bit darker, um, but I don't use too much for this because what I'm going to do is just put it in a corner of your eye. Oh, this lighting is terrible. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but not all of your eye. I just put it in the corners, kind of sweep it out a little bit just so that you notice that the color is there and that's about it. I don't know what the technical words are for this so you're gonna have to excuse me for that. Oh my god, the lighting in my room is terrible. I tried to actually film it in the bathroom because it had better lighting but the camera was being a bit of a pain. <sighs> there we go, that's fine. Okay, now of course the trick is with um, Disney princesses is that they're because they're drawings or on a computer they their eyes are quite big so you gotta try and make your eyes a little bit bigger um, of course you can always cheat and use Photoshop but no. um, if you're doing photos and stuff for your cosplays um, I basically all I do is use a lot of eyeliner not too much though here we go so both, both on like both lash lines. Um, so, use a felt eyeliner pen for the top. Now, you guys are gonna laugh at this because I am so bad at eyeliner; it's ridiculous. I, I remember my first time trying it; total disaster. It's getting better as I go on, but it's still pretty bad. See what I mean? It's, it's, it's awful. Okay. I think it's slightly bigger than you would normally do. Because, of course, you know, you're meant to be an animated character, so, you know. So don't worry if you feel like an absolute idiot. I mean, look what I'm wearing. <laughs> okay. I don't know if the camera can see that. But I'll do I'll do a quick close up and then you can see like the finished result and then just a pencil eyeliner and I just put it on as normal. Again, this lighting is terrible. So I just use like a pencil eyeliner really, just going out and then of course mascara as well. And of course, speaking of mascara, that's what you also need as well. The good thing about Anna is that she's not, um, she is pretty, but she's not like, you know, like, oh my god, like something like, you know, Cinderella or Aurora or something. So you don't, so I don't think fake lashes are really appropriate for Anna. I mean, you could use them for Elsa, but, you know. But with Anna, she's a little bit more 
she's a little bit more playful so normally I don't put my makeup on with the wig on it's just <laughs> which is probably why I put my foundation on first okay so um quick close-up of the eyes like I said this uh, but you can kind of see the kind of gold color and then of course I made my eyes bigger with the eyeliner so you know Okay, now, um, also the thing about the difference between me and Honor is that I've obviously got much darker hair than she has. So, because she's got ginger hair, I've got to gingerize my eyebrows. So, because I've got very dark ones. You don't need, like, a specific shape. But try not to make it look too... My lid just came off. Try not to make it look too harsh looking, I think. What's the colour of this? It is. Just a brown pencil, just a brown pencil. But it's a very, very light brown. So, like, don't go full, you know, ginger or anything. <laughs> And then also what you want to do with your brow pencil is just very, oh my god, is that going to show up? Very, 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 very subtle freckles. Because Anna has a few freckles. Don't try and be a bit too harsh, otherwise you're going to look like, like um, Pippi Longstocking. And you don't want that. Now the thing that also um, is quite keen with a lot of um, Disney princesses is of course they have very very rosy cheeks. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to make my cheeks very very rosy. So again this is PS Lush, Lush Blusher Pink. And then you want to try and do a little bit of a circle. I want to make them very very pink. Especially for Anna because she's a bit more white. Elsa would use a lot less. For obvious reasons. So there you go. I'm a bit more pinky. <laughs> then, of course, the last one is lipstick. I hate wearing lipstick in real life. I absolutely hate it. But now sometimes I see a few princesses that would just wear like very very pink kind of like um, my blush um, I decide to go a little bit more natural it's sort of um, what's it called just rouge really it's kind of like half pink half red kind of color because I just I want to make it a little bit natural And I think for Anna, she doesn't really need um, a lip liner or anything. I think, you know, she's just not that kind of person. So there we go. That is how I create my Anna. So you can see like a little bit transformation. It's a little bit more so. So without the eccentric eyebrows and without the eccentric blush and lipstick, um, you could, you know, wear this casually. <laughs> and I say that as I'm wearing my Anna costume, so you know. Um, and of course without the freckles, of course. But you can see a slight transformation there. Okay. And then of course, I need to complete my costume with, with the winter cloak, of course. Now this is kind of a pain putting it on with my wig on because you don't want to get like the pigtails tangled or whatever. And there you go. And there you go. So, um, that's my Anna. <laughs> um, so, I, I hope that you enjoyed um, this tutorial and I will see you in the reviews. Bye, Bye guys. You, Alex. So, sorry, we gotta say goodbye to Anna. Um, so, like I said, I was going to do the animated Cinderella version from Disney as well as the 2013 Broadway version. Um, however, I am going to also talk about the 2015 live action version or the Disney remake or whatever you want to call it. 
Um, just to really explain in a bit much detail why I don't like that movie so much and why I think it doesn't work as much as like these two ones. So, yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, I hope you enjoy. Um, now we're going to put this review in a little bit of reverse because I think I'm going to leave um, our main character of Cinderella until the last round. So we're going to start with story. Okay, so, everyone pretty much knows the story of Cinderella, right? It's probably one of the first fairy tales that we're introduced to, and everyone knows it, even if they twist it around, or, you know, the, the, like the Broadway version did, and the live-action version did. Everyone knows the story. We all know what happens, we all know the... Yeah. But, of course, it's the way you tell it. Because... You can do it really well, or you can do it very imaginative, you can make it very emotional, or sometimes if you get it wrong, you get it wrong. So it's kind of, it's kind of um, an interesting fairy tale to kind of, it's not like you can just tell this, you understand. So, okay, how are we going to start this? Well, okay, so... The Disney animated version and the Broadway version, they both pretty much start out kind of the same. Um, we start out with seeing Cinderella immediately as the servant girl and we already get a sense of this has pretty much been her life. She's the servant girl, she has an overbearing stepmother and stepsisters. Yeah. Um, so, and um, basically in the 2015 version there's a reason why they don't tell the backstory. I I remember going to see this because I had to go see the Frozen Fever short um, when I was working as Anna and, um, you know, obviously I needed to see the short. And I remember, like, the first, f like, five minutes or something like that when they show the parents, I was like, oh my god, like, am I, am I actually going to be able to get through this movie? It was so over the top, happy, I was just like, oh wow. Um, yeah, there's a reason why they don't tell the backstory. We get the fact that she has a lovely relationship with her father, and you can, you can say that while she's the servant girl and her father's dead. So this is pretty much what the Broadway version did, um, that you got, you, you got the sense that her father absolutely loved Cinderella, and um, you know, and Cinderella keeps hold of the one possession that her dad has left, which is just an old coat. And what does the stepmother do? She tours it up, saying, well, he's dead now. Pff, move on. So that was pretty harsh. <laughs> that was pretty harsh of the stepmother to do that. But you get the sense that, yeah, she loves her dad. Um, I would say that in the animated version, they never really bring up her dad, which is kind of weird, but I suppose that maybe because, like, he died when she was so young and you know, you, you got you got the sense that she she was kind of brainwashed into thinking this way. It's kind of like, you know, I'm just gonna have to put up with the situation I'm in now. Um, you know, um, there's a lot of talk about the mother in the 2015 version, but again, like, I don't know. Actually, you know, going back to the animated one, she does mention her mother by trying to um, alter the dress and stuff, so that's, that's fine. So you get a little bit of mention, but, you know, it's... I don't mind if they don't mention the father or the mother, to be honest, but, you know. Um, but there's a reason why most versions do not tell the backstory. Yes, <laughs> okay. Um, and of course, um, in both stories, um, Cinderella is wanting to go to the ball. Obviously she can't because of her overbearing stepmother. She, a fairy godmother comes along, she, you know, gets what she wants, goes to the ball, falls in love with the prince. Glass slipper, you know the whole story. Everyone knows the story. So, um, and the animated version, what I really love, and I'll get to this in the final round as well, is that really, it just tells a straight, straightforward story without any twists or whatever, but they do it in such an emotional way. And this kind of comes from the villains and the main character, and so, you know, and I really love the pacing of the movie. It's very... It's very slow at start, and, you know, sometimes it gets energetic, you know, it's very kind of slow moving, it's very relaxing to watch through, you know, I, I, I like that. Um, especially when you get the idea of, you know, the first few minutes is showing 
this is what Cinderella does. She gets up really early, pretty much at dawn. Um, she goes downstairs, feeds the cat, feeds the animals, then feeds her step family, and then is given even more chores to do. And if she gets caught doing something, even, even if it's not her fault, she will be given a thousand more chores to do. So basically, she's being told, you're going to do a thousand one thing for every one thing you do wrong. So you automatically, and this is, and obviously, as we found out that her, her father died when she was a child, this has pretty much been her life every single day. And boy, does that get her emotional response, at least for me, because it's like, my god. Um, and of course, you're probably asking, well, why didn't she just leave? I will get to this in the final round, okay? It's just kind of... However, the thing that is really great about the Broadway version is the romance. Oh my god, this is probably... From, from the traditional Cinderella story, the Broadway version, the best, best element of it is the romance between Cinderella and the Prince. I mean, oh my god, this was such a huge update. And it's probably why I really love the musical so much, because of how much they really did the romance part. It was just such an update. As you guys know, there's not that much romance in the animated version. Does the Prince even get a line in this? I know he sings a song with her, but that's about it. Um, <laughs> But honestly, they get so much character from the prince and Cinderella, and because of that, their chemistry is so good. Um, I appreciate that they tried to update the romance in the 2015 version, and while I'm going to say that the prince isn't a bad character, Cinderella, on the other hand, will get to her in the final round so everything is just leading up to the final round right now but so but the broadway version again because these two characters they have character they have chem it really helps the chemistry because the prince is being told how to be a leader and cinderella helps him become you know the fact that he can do this and so you know you get that sort of i really love the fact that they play to the part that yes there is a sort of physical attraction there, but the thing that really draws them together is the personality. I really like that it's really Cinderella's kindness that it's like, you know, she gets her grand entrance at the start, you know, with a dress and whatever, and everyone's like, oh my god, she's so beautiful. Um, but the prince doesn't immediately walk over to her. He immediately walks over to her when she starts to show her kindness to others. That is what brings them together. And I really, that was such a good touch. I really liked that. That was, like, personality, obviously, it plays a bigger part than appearances, so, you know. Um, so, and again, because Cinderella helps him become the leader of, you know, who he wants to be, and that, you know, he, he's doubting himself about it, but, you know, she helps him along the way, so they help each other out. And that is brilliant. So I think, story-wise, Broadway version gets the point. But what's a fairy tale without a little in, without a little confrontation? Here are our villains. Okay, so of course the villains are usually the stepmother and the stepsisters. Although the stepsisters, I never really see them as true antagonists in most versions because sometimes in most versions. You get the one where one's nasty, one's nice, or they're just kind of being used by the stepmother or something like that. So, you know, they're just sort of brought up that way. So, the stepmother really is the true antagonist of the story. And, um... <sighs> okay. Kate Blanchett in the 2015 version, she is just way too, like, ridiculous to take seriously, and so, like, and I don't know, I don't know if it's just me, but I just get the sense that she thinks, oh, I'm just in a Disney fairy tale, I'm not gonna try so hard. I kind of get that from her, and it's, uh, you know, I know she's a good actress, but man, this really didn't come through in this one. I was just kind of like... I don't know, and the way that she's dressed, that really doesn't help, and I'll talk about that in Imager. Um, the stepmother in the Broadway show is kind of the same, but she does have her moments of being threatening. Like I said, she rips up the only possession that Cinderella has of her father. I remember the first time I saw that, I was like, whoa, 
okay, that is cruel. So, you know, um, and then, of course, you get the ripping the dress, you get the ripping of the... She seems... This stepmother seems to like to rip stuff apart, okay? <laughs> Symbolism much? But, um... But I feel like this stepmother is really played for laughs again. And believe me, she's funny! Like, I, I... You know what? At least she's funny. But I feel like maybe if they made her a little bit more threatening, I don't know... It's a little bit kind of... Most of the time when she's trying to threaten or blackmail someone, it's mainly played for laughs. You don't really get that kind of horridness about her, you know. And she's funny! So at least there's an upside. I'll give them... I'll give her the benefit of the doubt. I can't remember who played her. I think it was Harriet... something or other. But she was funny, at least. So she is entertaining. Um, the stepsisters, on the other hand, um, one is good and is basically has a crush on another character that I will bring up in supporting characters, and then the other one who is basically there for laughs. Like, none of them are really that evil. Stepsisters in the live-action 2015 version, what was the point in having those two? They were so forgettable. I mean, the comedy was absolutely weak and there was just no point it's like they were just sort of there just because it's the cinderella story you gotta have the stepsisters well can you at least make them entertaining or at least funny because these two certainly were now the animated version on the other hand oh my god okay this is this is probably the advantage of being animated is that the comedy kind of works because they're cartoons. You can kind of emphasize on their appearances, make them look cartoony, especially compared to something like Cinderella. I don't know. And they're funny. Like, Anastasia and Gisela, they're probably the most well-remembered stepsisters because of the comedy. And actually, these are probably the cruelest stepsisters in any kind of Cinderella adaption. I mean... Do I even need to say about the dress ripping scene? I remember as a kid, I was like, oh my god! <laughs> I was, oh my god, I'm not gonna lie, that scene shocks, shocked me as a kid. And I was kind of like, you know, every time I would watch it, I'm like, oh god, it's coming to this scene. And, oh no. um, and that was brilliant. And so, you know, um, so, and let's move on to Lady Tremaine in the animated version. Holy shit is this woman cruel, okay? I was so scared by her and intimidated by her as a kid. I mean, they did not play her off for laughs. She she was basically kind of, oh my god, her stares. I was like, don't, don't give me that. Um, I just, you really got the emphasis that she is going to do everything possible to make sure that Cinderella has no happiness whatsoever. And even though some people may argue about, well, what was the motivation? Why is she so mean to Cinderella? But you know what? I don't care. She was threatening. I felt the conflict of the story and having that conflict really helps the emotion of the story. And so, easily, the best villains are in the Disney version. But let's have a look at supporting characters. To be fair, about the 2015 version, the supporting characters are not that bad. I mean, like, I... The prince is probably the best element of the 2015 version. I mean, you know, he's pretty much taught about being a leader. I like, I liked, I liked seeing the relationship between him and his father. So that was actually kind of nice. You know, I was like, well, there's something in this. But unfortunately, because they're trying to tell the T Cinderella story at the same time, that's what turned off for me. So, uh, but I will give the benefit of the doubt for that one. Okay. Supporting characters in the Broadway version, there's actually quite a lot of them. Um, we've got the prince, and as I said, he is so... Oh my god, this is probably the best prince character I've ever come across in a Cinderella story. Um, he is... Um, his parents are dead, and the kingdom has been in a regency, and he's just come back from university, and so now he's, you know, ready to take the throne, but he's not sure if he can do a good job. However, the regency has been a little bit harsh to the kingdom, and sort of being a little bit prejudiced towards, you know, um, poor people. Basically, 
the poor people aren't being treated very well. And so that leads to another supporting character called, I'm trying to remember his name, Jean-Michel. And he's trying to start up a revolution against the prince because everyone thinks that the prince is behind it, even though obviously he's been off at university. So everyone thinks that the prince is very, very horrible. However, when Cinderella meets him in the woods while doing her chores, she finds out that that was the prince and that he was a very, very kind man. And so her other motivation of going to the ball is to actually tell the pr to kind of warn him that this is what the people are thinking of him because she knows deep down that he's a very very nice guy but obviously she falls in love with him and that kind of becomes a little bump in the road so that was kind of nice so there's a little bit more sort of a motivation for her to go to the ball other than just have a good time um and also i remember this particular joke that they said where they feel like the way to build up the prince's reputation is to have a royal wedding, hence why they set up the ball. And he says, but I have no experience with women. I was at an all-boys university. Yes, that was a funny joke. But in some cases, that kind of adds up to why it was love at first sight kind of thing. Because it's like, yeah, he's not used to being around women. <laughs> you know? So, I don't know. Maybe that's just me seeing that, but I don't know. Um, and... Yeah, so the supporting characters are really, and definitely, the fairy godmother in the Broadway version. Now, I really like the fairy godmother in the animated film. I like her, I like her that the fact that they make her kind of like this sort of grandmotherly figure, you know, kind of like a real life godmother, except she's a fairy. So they kind of made it a little bit more subtle. And, okay. The 2015 version, if you guys remember in that one, um, the fairy godmother comes in as a beggar woman, asks for a drink of milk or water or something, and Cinderella does it. Again, this is another problem with the movie, which I will bring up in a minute. Um, however, like I said, this came out in 2015, the Broadway version came out in 2013, and did the same thing, but differently. So pretty much the 2015 is pretty much ripping off the Broadway version as well. So, so the the fairy godmother starts off as an old beggar woman, and she kind of plays her as this very kind of mentally insane, well not mentally insane, but kind of out of the box kind of character. And so she has a sort of reputation of being mad and whatever. And Cinderella is the only one that actually, she basically, you get this idea that this woman has been visiting the house all the time and Cinderella without being asked. Okay. So Cinderella does it by her own will without being asked, without being more to, she feeds this old woman. And at one point she gives money to her without any orders, any asking, she just does it. And so, when the fairy godmother says, you know what, you're the only one who showed me true kindness, when she reveals on that night that she's the fairy godmother, you get that moral of kindness. The moral of being kind in the 20- oh my god, was this moral just shoved down your throat, my god, I've never heard a moral being said out loud in a movie so much before in my life. But, with the fairy godmother, she asks her- can I have some milk? And Cinderella's like, yeah, sure, whatever. And it's just like, so basically she got all, she got the coach and the dress and the slippers because she did as she was told. Okay. <laughs> and it's like, I don't, I don't know, it doesn't feel like much of a payoff to me. You know, with the fairy godmother in the Broadway version, that re that moral really, you, you got that sense that she earned it because of how kind she was to this woman and how kind she is to everyone else. You know? That's my point. So, okay, so now let's go to the animated version. Okay, like I said, the prince has no character. I really like the king and the grand duke. I think their scenes together are really funny, so I kind of forgive the movie a little bit more. I don't know why they put more scenes with the king and the grand duke, but whatever, they're funny. So I have fun watching them. And then the other main supporting characters is, of course, the talking mice. Now, I usually see that people either love them or hate them. I really don't mind them. I can understand if they drive some people insane, that's fine, I can, I can sort of get that. Particularly when they're just sort of doing like a kind of slapstick and nothing to do with the plot. Yeah, I... But to be fair, maybe they were trying to do that for an outlet for the boys. So it's kind of like, they're not... 
they kind of provided slapsticks for the boys to watch. So maybe, so I never feel like the animated version was very all women based. It kind of felt like, you know, yeah, you know, it's gender neutral. Like, I, I you know, I, I don't blame boys if they say they like watching Cinderella. That's fine. Um, and they do play a more active role than other Disney sidekicks or animal sidekicks, much more than, say, something like Snow White or Sleeping Beauty or something. They actually do play a part, like helping make the dress, helping her get out the room at the end. So, you know what? They're actually there for a purpose. But... As far as the supporting characters go that actually play a part in the story, I would have to give the point to the Broadway version, mainly because of the prince and the fairy godmother. Even though I like the supporting characters in the animated version, but you know, that's really more for last and entertainment rather than the story. Okay, this is gonna be hard. <laughs> Imagery. Okay, so, okay, I will give the 2015 version credit. It does look nice. It's a nice looking film. However, in my opinion, it is way too nice looking. It is way too glorified. And again, this really doesn't emphasize on the Cinderella story. It is a rags to riches story. And man, the imagery does not help. It is way too much. Like I said, when the stepmother, when you see her for the first time, I'm like, what the fuck is she wearing? You know, it's so distracting. And the fact that the dress that Cinderella wore throughout the entire movie was gorgeous. So like when she gets the gown and everything, I'm like, whatever, it's just another pretty dress. It's not, there's no real emphasis on it. Oh, I mean, there was certainly emphasis on it, because, man, she spins around in this dress for God knows how long. But it's like, yeah, whatever. She looks pretty throughout the whole movie, so it kind of gives begs the question of why the fuck did no one recognize her at the ball? I don't know. Um, I would say that the Broadway version, it does look nice, and the costumes are nice and everything, but I don't know, it's... I've just seen more Broadway shows that are just a lot more better looking. So something like, I don't know, after seeing Phantom of the Opera or, you know, Rocky Horror or something, I don't know, the imagery just really stands out in those musicals or Chicago or something like that. Um, but, yes, Cinderella, it does look nice. And the special effects was really good because even the dress transformation happens all live on stage. Her hair changes, dress changes, all in front of your eyes. So I was really impressed with the special effects. And I do like that some of the Im imagery is sort of like a sort of dance choreography thing. So like when everything is turning back to normal, that was a really good scene. I really liked how they did that. But overall, I wouldn't say that the best thing about the Cinderella on the Broadway version is the imagery. I would say the best element is the romance and the music. Um, the animated Disney version, it's Disney animation, okay? And to be honest, like, the Cinderella, it's really kind of subtle. Again, this is going back to the 2015 version. The 2015 version, the imagery in that film makes... Uh, your mate, they made a cartoon look subtle. And believe me, I'm not joking. This cartoon... I mean, like, the animated version is just beautiful to look at. And I'm not saying that just because it's animation. It really looks stunning. The grandness of the ball, the kind of, I like, they really made it subtle on, like, the rags and the riches story, and it really comes through in the imagery. I mean, Walt Disney said himself, apparently his favorite piece of animation was the dress transformation scene, and I will get to that in a minute. So, you know. There's no real contest. The Disney animated one wins for imagery. That's, it's a no-brainer. Okay, and finally we're gonna get to our main character, everybody. Let's look at Cinderella herself. Okay, so this is gonna be really kind of interesting to talk about because mostly when people think about Cinderella, the character herself, they usually think of as a very bland, not really interesting character, particularly Oh. Since a lot of fairy tale female characters have kind of, you know, been updated and a little bit more interesting, is fair enough. 
Um, but really, to me, Cinderella is meant to represent the everyday girl. She's meant to represent this girl who's caught in this bad situation and her journey out of it. Like I said, it's a rags to riches story. But you got to show that she's a human being. And that is what drives the story forward. And this is where the 2015 version really fails. Oh my god, if you want to talk about Bland, go to the, see that version. I have... They really made her, like, so over-the-top happy, like, nothing's wrong with my life! And so, when she's put as the servant girl, I didn't feel anything for her. And so when she gets that happily ever after, or she goes to the ball, I didn't feel anything! It's like... I wish I did, but and I was saying to myself, okay, well, what made me happy about when the Cinderella and the animated version went to the ball? Is it just because I was a kid and this was my introduction to the fairy tale? Because I think most people in the past, when they were growing up, their introduction to the Cinderella story was through the Disney version. It could be, but honestly, the animated version of Cinderella, and I'm going to argue this a lot, She's mainly, she's mainly sort of classed as this very, very bland character along the lines of Snow White and Aurora and stuff, but honestly, she is much better than those two, and she's one of my favourite princesses. In fact, she's quite high up there, to be honest, and you're thinking, why? Because one of the things that I, yes, it's good to have a positive attitude, that's fine. And this is what the Cinderella in the animated film does. She has a positive attitude. But you can clearly see that she is not happy in her situation. And when the stepmother like gives her even more chores to do, you get that expression from her face. It's kind of like, okay, okay. And she sort of has that kind of, okay, just get, you know, just get through it. Just get through it, you know? It's like, it's not going to be like this forever. Like, you, you, sort of, you got that sense. She's not happy, but she's going to do whatever it takes to keep her optimism, you know, optimism there. And she just, and you, you just see that she just keeps holding on. And so, when it leads to the dress being ripped apart, and that is when she finally breaks down, Oh my god, that is why it shocks me, because you see how much she's trying to, you know, s remain positive and, you know, uplifted and stuff. But once that happens and she, you know, r I don't blame her. I don't blame her for finally breaking down. And so that, and so I think that really, and that also, you know, makes the fairy godmother come. Because that is when she finally just kind of gives up and is just like, no, I can't do it anymore. It's like, I, you know, I keep trying and I keep trying, but man, nothing is going to change because of the situation that I'm in. And you could make the argument, well, why didn't she just leave? Because, as I said, the father dies when she's a kid. So as a kid, you kind of get the sense that, yes, she would be kind of used to this way of being the servant girl because that's the way that she's been brought up. But also, because he died when she was a kid, her house is the only place that she knows. So there's that sense of, and I really like the fact that in the, in the Disney movie, they only show two locations, which is of course the palace and the chateau. And so you got that sense of isolation. So you got that sense, yeah, her only friends are talking mice because that is the only friends that she's like, it's sort of like, yeah, okay, you know what? I'll take what I got. At least I've got, you know, friends and you know, she loves, she loves the mice. She saves, she, you get the sense that she saves pretty much the mice because she does it at the beginning of the movie. So basically, she is a character. Not much, but she is a character. There is a human being inside her. And so when you see that, so as a kid, I always got the fact that if you work hard and you stay optimistic, you know, something will, it, never ever give up hope. And that's what a dream a wish your heart makes. I love that song, okay? So that's what it taught me. It taught me never give up even in, you know, horrible... If you find yourself in a horrible, stressful situation, just keep going. You know, it's it's not... And, and I think that's why a lot of people are emotionally attached to that version because everyone's been in a stressful situation. Everyone's been in a situation where we don't want to be, but it's just something that we have to put up with. And so, 
when it le so when you get something that's really great and you know so for example I got an example okay I absolutely hated doing my A levels I I, I am not a very, you know, I am not a very smart girl. I'm not. So, in academic wise. So, I found A-levels really hard. And, you know, and my last year of school, I worked my fucking ass off. I basically had no social life. I, well, I, I kind of did because the friends I had, they were awesome. But, you know... I was in this stressful situation, you know, I was thinking to myself, I gotta get to uni, I gotta get to uni, and like, you know, I had to push myself all the time, and I'm still doing that now, but, you know, and then at the end of the year, I was rewarded with the Danny Elfman music of Tim Burton concert, and you know what, probably, and so that felt like such a huge reward to me, you know, that pro so, also because of how amazing the event was and you know the fact that Tim Burton was really there oh my god but um and how amazing it was it felt even more amazing for the fact that I really felt like I earned I felt like I earned it you know because I got the grades I needed and stuff like that so I so it, this and this is why the fairy tale is so loved by everyone because it's something that we all wish for. It's something that, you know, you're caught in this situation and you want to get out. And it's that idea of getting out and going to something better, you know. That's why people are very emotionally invested in the story. And this is something that the animated version did. The Broadway version, again, like I said, really emphasizes on the romance. And I can understand why the prince would fall for Cinderella. She is a very, very positive person. And um, you get the sense that she's been working hard for a long time. They put more emphasis on her kindness more than anything else, but believe me, it was done much better than the 2015 version, like way better. Um, so you got a sense that, you know, it's fine. So the character's not bad. However, I would say that the prince is more interesting to me in the Broadway version. And when it comes to the traditional, so you, you get sort of wrapped up in the prince's story and the fact that, you know, he's going to be a great leader and all that kind of thing and you get invested in the romance and stuff. But then when they get back to like the traditional, you know, Cinderella story and stuff, that's where it kind of loses it a bit, especially the ending. So, like... I don't know, like, I always felt like the glass slipper and searching for this girl who wears the glass slipper and stuff, that really felt rushed and I don't know like maybe if they put more emphasis because they were being prejudiced towards you know poor people and stuff like that and you know they they judge them and everything like that I don't know maybe if they put more emphasis and they kind of did it where Cinderella volunteers herself to try on the slipper in front of the whole kingdom like she comes forward and says I haven't tried it on can I try it on and um you know that's fine um, but maybe if they put more emphasis on the fact that, oh my god, it's a servant girl who, you know, fits the glass. Maybe that would have been a little bit more stronger, but I don't know. It was sort of kind of, it sort of wrapped it up more with the stepmother apologizing and I don't know. Like, I don't know. I felt like, I felt like the ending was a little bit rushed and I don't know. I didn't really feel too happy for me. I don't know. Like, hmm. I think it's because I was so invested in the romance and the princess story that maybe when they got back to the Cinderella story, I don't know, it's kind of felt a bit rushed. Um, however, the animated version, and this is probably why most people, when they think about the Cinderella story, the animated one always pops out. And like, again, this is probably, and again, going back to the example of hard work, why did you think in Walt Disney World that you know, the castle that they put in is called Cinderella's Castle instead of, like, I don't know, because I was surprised that it was called Cinderella's Castle instead of Snow White's Castle, because Snow White was the very, very first film that they did, first animated film that they did, so why was it Cinderella? Because it's sort of, like, a lot of children, they wish they could go to Disney World, I wish to go to Disney World, and believe me, we're going. <laughs> we're, we're going! And, um... So when you see that castle right in front of you, you get that kind of, re you get that kind of, wow, you know, that feeling of reward. 
And so I think that's what that castle represents. And I think that's why Walt was very, very personal to this story. And you can definitely tell from the movie. And that's why, like I said, when people think of Cinderella, they automatically think of the Disney animated version because it was emotionally invested. And that's the, and that's the thing that really makes a fairy tale as great as they are is the emotion. If you can, who cares about the logical problems that may be staring you in the face? You're emotionally invested. I don't care if there was hardly any romance, okay? I like the song, so this is love. I mean, I really like that song, so probably why. But the emotion of this rags to riches story and the idea that Cinderella really represented the sort of, there was like this human being inside and you felt the emotion, the happily ever after, really felt earned to me. And so that is the version that I think is the best.